The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. This is the basis for today's message. Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week, we heard about how Jesus gives us a place to belong in the house of God. Not in a mansion in the sky somewhere, but he gives us a place to belong right here and right now for eternity. This week, Jesus continues in that same kind of discourse with his disciples. And this week, we hear Jesus calling us into a mystic, sweet communion so that we would learn to keep his commandments. This morning, as we walk through the text of this morning, I'm going to present to you a couple of images to try to draw us deeper into a meditation of that mystic sweet communion. So let's start on verse 1. And I promise I will spend a longer time on verse 1. I won't preach for 30 minutes. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And as he says this, if we're well-trained Lutherans, maybe your alarm bells are going off. You think, I thought that the gospel was about what Jesus did for me and not about what I need to do for him. And that's okay. If that's where you are right now, remember to read this in context. Remember to read this in the gospel of John. Jesus does not say, if you love me, you do what I say perfectly every time no matter what. But As we remember that this gospel wasn't actually written so that people could preach on a couple of verses at a time and in little increments, it was actually written so that it would be read to the congregation in one sitting. So if you ever have a two-hour chunk, sit down and listen to the gospel of John, and you'll kind of get the idea. And as you do that, the word commandment, Jesus actually uses it for kind of a specific reason reason for a specific purpose in the gospel of John. All the way back in John chapter 12, Jesus is talking about the commandment of the Father. And he says the commandment of the Father is eternal life. Commandment equals eternal life. And then in, in John 14, 15, 16, 17, Jesus makes a big deal about making sure that his disciples understand that his words are the Father's words. He and the Father are one. The commandment of the Father is his commandment. And then in John chapter 17, he says, This is eternal life to know God and the one whom he sent. This is eternal life. So commandment equals eternal life. Eternal life equals knowing God and the one whom he sent. So as Jesus says these words, just to understand what he's saying, he's saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Which means you will hold on to the ministry that I bring. Because Jesus is the revelation of God the Father. When Jesus is talking about the commandment, he's talking about himself and everything he does on this world. Sure, it includes what he says to do. It includes his teaching, but it also includes everything he has done for us. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Hold on to these things. Because that's what you do if you love someone. 
So let me introduce the first image. As I stand here and preach to you this morning, far away there is a box on a shelf in a closet in the bedroom that I grew up in full of all of the stuff that I have produced through my school career. (laughs) And obviously I didn't hold these things for a really long time. It was my mother, she's the nostalgic one, who, who took all of these things, the picture that I drew in first grade, even though if I went into my office and drew a picture, all of you would think a first grader drew it, even right now. But she held on to that. She held on to the story from second grade, held on to the kindergarten graduation certificate, this box full of stuff that I might consider garbage that she treasures. She keeps that stuff, holds on to that stuff, remembers that stuff as a way of remembering those times. Many of us have that box or that folder or that chest full of treasures. Maybe it's, maybe it's at your parents' house or maybe you're a parent with that still in your house trying to pass it on out of the house. But we have the box full of treasures. And whether we realize it or not, we have a box like that in our hearts. And we have this kind of treasure chest in our hearts of our own past experiences. And maybe it lines up with the box on the shelf in the closet, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's full of our successes, or maybe it's full of our failures. It's a story that we tell ourselves about our lives. And it's the story that we ultimately live our entire lives out of, with that truth being kind of the baseline. It could be full of successes and failures. It could be full of hurts and people we have hurt. It could be full of of the broken shards of glass of the things that we once valued Or it could be full of those pieces glued together in a haphazard way. Sometimes the box of our heart could even be full of the grudges that we hold against those people who have hurt us. Whatever fills the box in our hearts, the the treasure chest that we live our lives from, Jesus tells us in this commandment, if you love me, you will keep my commandments He's telling us to take my ministry, take my life, take everything that I have revealed to you and let that be on the shelf in your hearts. That's ultimately what it means to be baptized. It means that the most important thing in our lives isn't the thing that hurt us the most. It isn't the thing that that we are moved by most deeply. But the most important event in our lives actually happened through those baptismal waters. The most important event in our lives because of our baptism is Jesus coming. The, The entire Godhead finding his place among humanity in human flesh. It's Jesus going to the cross. It's Jesus giving up his life for the forgiveness of our sins. It's Jesus rising from the dead to conquer death. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says, hold on to this. Hold on to this. Put it like a treasure chest on the shelf in your heart and pull it out every once in a while and leaf through what's in there and look at it. Listen to it. And I think to hold on to these commandments and love Jesus by doing so looks differently in a lot of our lives. Maybe for you, if if right now what Jesus is to you is a really cool story and I really want to know this Jesus and I think that what he is and what he says is really awesome but I don't know what he actually asks me to do. Maybe holding on to those commandments, keeping those commandments, looks like just learning more about what Jesus actually teaches. Maybe it looks like spending time reading the scriptures or listening to a sermon series or going to an explorations class. Or maybe keeping the commandments for you this week will look like the time when you make a decision. And you feel like you're in the cartoon with an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. And you know what the right decision is to make. 
but sometimes you don't want to do it all the time. Well, to hold those commandments means to value what Jesus says and to go with him in those times of decision. Or maybe for you this week, to hold on to the commandments of Jesus means to look back on the week and say, I've messed up. I've already made the wrong decision. But I love the Lord and I want to keep his commandments. And so you come back to this place to hear the story again of what Jesus has done for you. And even though you know that the service is going to start with you telling everybody, I'm a sinner, you keep the commandments of Jesus, hold them dear, and come to hear the message of forgiveness proclaimed to you again. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's the first image, the the box or the treasure chest in our hearts of Jesus' life, that he invites us into the house of God, and in that house he puts this treasure chest on the shelf so that we would take it off and look through it. Second, he goes back to talking about how he invites us into the house of the Father. Jesus starts talking actually about the Holy Spirit, about the Holy Spirit coming into our lives. He starts talking about being orphans out there in the dark. Because all of us are orphans. We live in an orphan culture and we we have been orphans because of the sin of Adam and Eve that infects us and that we carry into our lives. The sin of wanting our own way rather than God's way. Keeping God at arm's length or out of our lives completely. We live in an orphan culture where all of us insist on our own way until ultimately we end up out of the house, out even of the orphanage in an alley somewhere between the homes. We surround ourselves in that orphan culture with the dogs of this world. And sometimes we befriend those dogs that are like, like the purebreds, the dogs that are, that are good, that, that are the good gift of Jesus, and we try to find our identity with those. Maybe by surrounding ourselves with a family, and finding our identity in the people that are gathered there. Maybe by surrounding ourselves with a community, even sometimes the community of the church and finding our identity in other human beings there. Maybe we try, try to live our lives in pursuit of health and, and the good gift of modern medicine and when we put all of our, our trust in it to prolong life and to make life seem easier. Maybe sometimes we take the good things in our lives and let them take the place of God and befriend them and end up as orphans surrounding ourselves with the dogs in the alley. Or maybe we just hold on to the street mutt of alcohol, of sex, of drugs, and we're orphans. But Jesus doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us in an orphan culture and he doesn't leave us as orphans. This is the whole point of the resurrection according to Jesus in these verses is I am coming back to you so that you won't be an orphan. And he comes back to his disciples and and he actually gives them the Holy Spirit so that they wouldn't be orphans. And the Holy Spirit is like that helper sent from the house of God. Not just a helper for us, but a helper of God who goes out and finds us when we were orphans in the alley and gathers us into the house of God. He gives us a place in the house of God, in the family of God. Because we cannot, we cannot by our own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ our Lord or come to him. The Holy Spirit transforms our world and calls us by the gospel. He transforms these disciples who a few days later would feel like orphans locked in an upper room, not believing the message that Mary had given to them 
that Jesus is risen. And the Holy Spirit would come into their lives and transform them from those cowards to the courageous preachers who go into the world and share a message that would change the world forever, the message of Jesus and what he has done for us. The Holy Spirit gathers us, we who were orphans, into the house of God. That's the second image. The Holy Spirit gathers us as orphans into the house of God. Jesus puts the treasure of his entire ministry on the shelf in our rooms. And he does all of this in the last verses to talk to us and to draw us deeper into this kind of mystic, sweet communion. As you read those verses, they don't really make sense. They're almost impossible to comprehend. And Jesus is, is using language here in a way that is beyond what human language can really attain. He is using human language in the best way possible to point us towards something that is so far beyond our comprehension that we won't completely grasp it until the day Jesus returns. He's talking about this mystic sweet communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that he actually welcomes us into. And this is what we were created for. This is how we were created to live our lives from this mystic, sweet communion that we can't possibly understand because of our fallen minds. But this is the goal of the Christian life that he is presenting to us again so that we would step towards him, meditate on these truths that we can't comprehend and long for the day when Jesus returns. (laughs) And we not only are gathered into the house of God, but we actually forget about the days of being the alley orphans we once were. We have a place to belong so fully that we are lost in this beauty of what God has prepared for us. All delivered through the Holy Spirit. When you talk about the Holy Spirit, you can't help but talk about the church. Because on this Mother's Day, as we reflect on all that God has done for us, we also thank him for our mother, the church. Who has, who has brought us this great message of Jesus, who has brought us up in faith. And maybe your story of of thanking God for the mother of the church, maybe your story is like mine and you actually can look to your own biological mother who keeps the things of Jesus on the shelf of her heart as a treasure and who shared those things with you, who, who raised you to actually talk about these things, to love these things that Jesus has done for you. Or maybe... Maybe you came to faith later in your life and you have other spiritual mothers that you look to that are, that are still calling you forward to keep the commandments of Christ and reminding you of the fact that Jesus loves you so much he gives up everything to welcome you into this mystic, sweet communion. Or maybe you are that figure to somebody. Whatever it is, I, I don't want to to make it smaller, that we should thank our mothers on Mother's Day for the fact that they, that they gave birth to us, that they raised us, that we survived, and that we are maybe reasonable human beings. But we should also thank them for the ways that they pour into our spiritual lives. We should also thank them for the ways that the Holy Spirit has worked through them to call us into this community of faith and remind us of the mystic sweet communion that we long for in Jesus. And when you talk about things that we can't really comprehend, I think one of the best ways to do so is to talk about it through poetry. And so I'm going to share this verse of the, of the hymn, The Church's One Foundation in conclusion on this mystic sweet communion. Yet, on, yet she on earth has union with God the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O blessed heavenly chorus, Lord save us by your grace, 
that we, like saints before us, may see you face to face. Jesus welcomes you into this mystic, sweet communion. He sends his spirit to welcome you as an orphan into his life. And he puts the treasure of his entire ministry on the shelf of your heart so that you would love him and keep his commandments. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.